but yeah, thanks for coming. That means that if, if you're here watching, that means you have an interest in saving Swifts in Sussex and possibly beyond, which is a fantastic thing. And um, it's one of the few areas of conservation that, you know, in urban areas, everyday people can get involved and work together to make a positive difference, not only for one species, but some, it's something that will have a repercussion for for wider conservation and, and sharing that ethos. So, so that's fantastic. Um, so, so I'll share my screen now and move over to the presentation. There we go. And hopefully you can hear that screaming in the background, which um, as Mark mentioned, well, link, linking back to what Mark just mentioned, that is part of the reason why they're called devil birds or one of the old folk names of this bird is, is devil bird, which is in the, in the evenings in the summer, you'll see them tearing around rooftops, uh, screaming like this in, in, in parties. Um, and they were likened to, to being demonic beings back in the day. And people were very superstitious and, and all that sort of thing. So one of the names is um, is Devil Bird because of that. Uh, David, just speak up a tiny bit, please. Okay. Um, so we'll start with the absolute basics, which is what is a, a swift, basically. Um, now, they're an aerial, eating, aerial insect eating bird. They're one of the few birds that spends almost all of their time in, in the air feeding on effectively aerial plankton um, and they're easily confused with three other species that you'll see in the summer months all of which arrive earlier in the year than common swifts um, which is the species in question that we're talking about in Britain um, and they're swallows house martins and sand martins but they're they're quite different but we'll get back onto that in a, in a moment for those of you less familiar with the identification side of things um, now they're in the class Apodiformes, so almost half of the world's birds are Passeriformes, and that includes your swallows, house martins and sand martins, so they're really quite unrelated to those birds. And Apodiformes actually includes hummingbirds and uh, tree swifts, which look similar, but as the name implies, perch more readily um, than, than true swifts and, and are found in more tropical regions. And within the Apodiformes, they're the, the kind of swifts that we're talking about are within the family Apodidae. Um, now there's 112 species of, of swift, of true swift worldwide. Um, true swift, that is not the tree swift. Um, and the common swift is the one that we see here in Britain routinely. Although we also get pallid and alpine swifts um, as annual vagrants. Alpine swifts tend to be in early spring, pallid swifts late autumn and they're very similar birds to the common swift. Um, and then there's a few extreme rarities, um, such as the white-throated needle tail from, and Pacific swift from Asia. And we also get chimney swifts every few years coming over from North America. Um, and there's also been white rump swift and little swift recorded as well in Britain. Um, and our common swift, although it's easy to think of it as a quintessential English bird of English villages and English towns and very much European bird and, and British bird, they, they have a widespread breeding range um, all the way across to Kazakhstan and, and China. But all of these birds then funnel back down to, to southern Africa to spend the winter across the, from across the entirety of that whole range. And as I alluded to earlier, they're a quintessential urban bird. All across that range, they're associated with, with towns and cities, um, being one of the very few birds that in modern times is almost exclusively tied to our way of life and the habitats that the anthropogenic habitats that we've created uh, across the world you don't tend to go to a nature reserve to see a swift at least not in a in breeding um in a breeding sense they'll go visit nature reserves to to feed perhaps but this is something that you'll have more of a chance seeing really in, in urban areas and there's a, a clearer photo of, of a common swift um, very distinctive shape, quite a plain brown bird in, in all, but very unique shape with those long, long wings, the primaries there, those um, feathers on the outer wing, the main flight feathers are, are massively long compared to the secondaries, which really pinched in the, the inner wing main feathers. Um, and that makes them one of the world's most supreme flyers in, in the avian world. 
Uh, now here's a, a quick ID chart on, on the confusion species, um, which the layman or, or somebody who's, who's just started bird watching might um, initially get a bit confused about. But once you get your eye in, these are all, all very distinctive and none less so than swift from, from all its um, superficial counterparts. Um, so the swallow, they tend, they'll, they'll be arriving around now, the very first ones, there's been a few reports already in Britain, but they tend to arrive in force from, from say mid-March and, and then the real pulse of them in, in April and they'll uh, then leave throughout the course of the autumn, September, October and a few stragglers into November and occasionally they'll hang around into the winter. Um, but they're a much, they're a much smaller bird than a swift, dark, lovely, shiny, metallic blue above, um, with that red chin bordered by a, a sort of blackish band just below the chin and below that you've got an off-white belly uh, and the wing is two-toned with, with the dark secondaries and primaries and then that paler sort of forearm and, and armpit and they've got that lovely long tail streamer especially the males trailing out which will, will reach a, a few centimeters and just below that little white spots are the, in the tail feathers as well um, so they fly, they're, they're very masterful flies in themselves, but they, compared to a swift, they, they flick their wings more, they're, they'll tend to perch much more readily on, readily on wires, um, and yeah, they're, they're, they're not exclusively an aerial, an aerial bird like a swift, which will need to stop flying and land, um, and they're, they're often more vocal in some situations than, than swallow than swift sorry especially on migration you'll you'll hear swallows calling as they fly over whereas swifts are only really vocal um, in in breeding scenarios and then the two similar sized birds to a, a swallow uh are house martins and sand martins they appear a bit smaller in flight than than a swallow and and far more so than a, than a swift um and they both have those much stumpier tails they're, they're the most stumpy tail birds out, out of this set um, and they're quite hard to tell apart from each other sometimes even experienced birders on busy days in in autumn uh, when, when loads of these things are moving through often big mixed flocks it's quite hard to, to tell how many house martins and how many sand martins are mixed in but when you get a good view um, the house martins are, have a similar upper part, upper, upper part color to, to swallows that sort of metallic black blue but they'll have that sugar lump rump that white patch and below they're just plain white apart from the juveniles which you have to be careful they have a slight uh, almost an impression of a breastband just below their chin but it's much weaker uh, than, than say the San Martin um, and I've heard them being likened to looking like sort of mini flying orcas or killer whales they have a vaguely similar pattern and if you're lucky enough to see one really close up they have lovely feathery legs and feet um, anyway San Martins uh, a similar colour. They're, they're possibly the most likely of these to be confused with a swift because of that brown colour. But they're the smallest of, of these species. Plain brown above, similar to a swift but not as dark. And without such a forked tail. Um, and importantly, they've got a white belly, white underparts, all the way through to the vent. And then that border at the top of the breast, uh, above which there's that white chin. And they'll have. Um, again, more of a flicking, uh, slightly weaker uh, flight than a, than a swift, which flies on these long sickle-shaped wings in a very commanding way. Long glides, twisting and turning, very manoeuvrable, often high up, um, and you can get a very distinctive impression of the, the real shape of a bird. Um, whereas it's apart from the mode of flight with these other here with these hirundines, um if you just froze them as a still, it might be hard to tell them from a flying finch or, or other small bird. And so they're a very different shape um, to, to a swift. Um, so if you get a good view of a swift, even even with good light, they'll, they'll basically appeal, appear dark brown, possibly all black. And with very good light, you might just get a, a hint of that pale chin. The juveniles in the autumn are much, they have sort of scaly pale edges to the feathers. Um, which can show up again if it flies against a, a hillside or, or a background that allows that, that sort of viewing. Um, but otherwise, they're a very plain bird in, in terms of plumage, but certainly not in terms of their size and shape.
and they probably they appear say two or three times larger than than these uh, than than the other here and than the here and dines. I shouldn't say other here and dines because a swift is not a here and dine. Um, the swallows, house martins, and sand martins are, are part of the passerine group, um, which are known as here and dines. Um, now, they're also confusable in that they'll nest these days largely alongside people um, and that does allow for a lot of mixing up in terms of uh, connotations and how people uh, associate with these birds because some species are messier than others so when people are thinking about getting swifts nesting in their area they, they might think they're going to make a mess um, and they might actually be thinking more of swallows and house martins um, so swallows, they're more of a rural bird. You won't really get them in, in urban centres at all. But if you go out into the countryside and you approach a horse stables or a barn in the summer, you'll see often see one zipping out of an entrance. And um, if you have the opportunity to look inside, you'll see in a crevice somewhere there's a, a, a little mud nest in a, in a corner. Um, and there might be several of them. They nest in, in small colonies, really. Um, and they've got an open shape to, to nest at, to, at the top. Uh, they'll gather the, the material when it, from puddles, muddy edges, take a lot of time building it. Um, and yeah, so in that sense, they're also very similar to house martins, which, which make their nests from hundreds upon hundreds or probably thousands. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but the, the average number is incredible. The number of droplets of mud that they use to, to create these nests, which are similar to swallows' nests but they tend to be uh, fixed up against an overhang, say an eave, um, and they have such a small entrance there that you can't get in that. People who ring birds, they'll, they'll go in and visit many nests of, of small birds and, and take out the, the young carefully and ring them and put them back in, but you can't really do that with house martins because you're, there's such a risk to damage the nest. So um, it's a very unique structure and you're very lucky if you have these nests on, on your house because these these are a conservation concern in themselves but they're a bit controversial at times because people will, will not always appreciate the the inevitable mess that the house martins make underneath but if you ask me it's definitely a price worth paying anyway um the swift which is the bird that we're really interested in tonight that is different altogether and that, that's looking for the, the smallest nook and cranny possible and Traditionally, that would be in an old tree, and um, there's still natural uh, colonies that nest in trees, I, I believe, in, in Scotland and certain parts of Europe. But, uh, and also cliffs, they, they historically would nest on, on in cliffs and, and banks and any area that's allowing such a tight entry point there. But these days, it's buildings. They'll nest in any old, uh, crevice under a soffit or under an eave, roof slates, they'll, they'll get in there and um, they'll approach at breakneck speed, or they'll look like it's breakneck speed, but if you slow it down, they're very accurately and very safely entering the nest hole. Um, and the trouble with, with this is, of course, modern housing is changing this for swifts, and that is ultimately the problem because um, Traditionally, they've they've nested in our in our buildings, but modern architecture doesn't always allow for that. But we'll explore that more as we go on. Um, so a big reason why we're here is that swifts are just mind-blowingly amazing birds. They're one of my favourite birds. That definitely is. I, I don't really have a favourite bird. I have a sort of top five, and swift is definitely up there. Obviously, being swift champion and myself forward for that and um there's various reasons why they they're just inspiring beings um so forget the peregrine which is just aided by gravity swifts are among the fastest birds in self-powered level flight and common swift has actually been clocked at pretty much 70 miles an hour which when you think about it a bird that size um with the body size of roughly say a starling propelling itself at um, 70 miles an hour. That's that's incredible. Um, and they do pretty much everything that they can get away with in the air. 
apart from there's obviously no way they can nest in the air but everything else they do they feed in the air either by chasing particular insects that have caught their eye or by hoovering it up with, with their with their mouths open and flying through an area of, of sky that has a, a decent mass of flying insects in there it, almost in the manner of an aerial high-speed basking shark they'll sleep in the air um, there's records of of pilots from back in the wartime encountering swifts way high up in the air at, at night um, just drifting they, they they'll sleep in a similar way to fish and dolphins in that they switch off half a hemisphere of, of their brain off at a time and and um, they'll just face into the wind and and, and sleep uh, drinking they can easily do either by flying through the rain or dropping down and, and um, picking up a, a drop from a lake or a river and bathing they basically do it. that's the same thing they can they can bathe river in the rain in the air or just lightly dip their belly in, in a lake and, and splash off and although they don't need to and they often it's a, it's a bit of a misconception that they always mate in flight because they don't if they if they can they'll they'll often um find it a bit less glamorous but more practical to mate in the nest they they do and and can mate in in the air um and that's not too unusual to see if you two, see two swifts flying with, with sort of fluttery wings is flying a bit differently and, and approaching each other you'll often see them then meet for a few seconds look like a four-winged banshee and then split off um and yeah they, they feed exclusively on insects basically and they're thought to because of how mobile they are and the way they fly they're thought to to feed on more species of animal than possibly any other at least in in britain possibly europe and you know, so in feeding their young, they gather these insects in the air, collate that food into a, a bowler, so a, a ball basically of up to a thousand insects at, insects at a time. Um, and they're remarkable in avoiding the weather and, and using the weather. So if if a low pressure system's coming in and there's storms and, and the conditions aren't great, uh, the young can shut themselves down effectively, go into a state of torpor. And the adults will then navigate around the storms and and the um, the poor weather, and they'll even cross. They've been known to cross the Channel or the Irish the Irish Sea from Scotland over to Ireland, and, and vice versa to collect the, the necessary resources to feed the young, which will, as I say, have shut down their their body um, their body operations until uh, the parents come back and can feed them again. And in Africa, though, they know to do the exact reverse thing because the, the better conditions for feeding themselves, the adults and the, the full grown birds is to head for the rain. So they, they do basically the reverse. Um, after leaving the swifts, the young, they're on their own. They actually leave before the adults leave the area. Um, so the, the adults will just turn up at the nest and, and find it's empty and the young will have, have gone and they might not touch down again for many months. They'll probably usually they'll come back a year or two afterwards. Uh, they'll, they'll migrate to Africa and then come back on prospecting visits at first. Um, and in that sense, they might then visit nest sites and that sort of thing. But it's, it's entirely possible um, that they they won't land again for a very very long time. So swifts are arguably they're an African bird. Really, they spend far more of their time here in Africa than they do here. Um, as soon as they've done their business, they're back off there. Um, and this is the, uh, a map showing the, uh, the, the route taken by uh, one of several swifts fitted with um, a, a tag by the British Trust for Ornithology. So you can see that uh, in, in late summer, they move back down to uh, West Africa through the, the tropics. And within the winter, they tend to move east and then move back. And they make a very rapid, actually, uh, spring migration back to Britain uh, to arrive. They tend to arrive uh, early May, sometimes 
certain people get their swifts back at the very end of April, or, or if you're watching migration on the coast, um, you'll you'll see them turning up sometimes even from say the 15th of April or so. Um, but they're they're the real pioneers uh, arriving very early. The the main arrival is is from uh, early May onwards, and you'll find that the the birds that I mentioned earlier, the, the young birds that are prospecting, they'll uh, come back a little bit later than those established adults. So they'll arrive in, in often June and, and into July before uh, just to have a quick look to check out potential nest sites before heading back um, with the adults, basically. Um, and an interesting phenomenon is that in June, usually in southwesterly winds, if you go to Spurn in East Yorkshire or many other places along the East Coast, you'll get huge movements of swifts. Um, sometimes into the tens of thousands moving south. Um, and that's thought to be, well, they, every bird that they've managed to age, I think, as far as I'm aware, has been in these movements, has been a first year bird. So one of these that's prospecting, and they seem to be these ones that are, are, are looking around, scouting around, and then uh, this weather's pushing them to the coast and moving down. And, and when this happens, you'll see them flying at almost shoulder height past you in their tens of thousands sometimes certainly thousands on a basically annual basis as a day or two each year uh, when that happens. Um, right. Now, the trouble, though, is that since 1995, they've declined by 53% uh, common swifts in Britain, according to the British Trust for Ornithology. Uh, and that's really not good news. Um, there's a few thoughts as to why this might be. Um, and the most obvious and compelling one, which uh, a lot of people around the country are, are working on, including us, is the availability of nest sites, which is becoming more and more of a problem. Um, because every every house built since, I think it's about 1960, roughly, the, the, there's no suitable eaves for them to get under. Um, and, well, that's it, basically. And, and the, older, the older buildings, uh, when they're renovated, they don't tend to think let's renovate these with with these uh, birds that are with us for only a few weeks every summer in mind. We'll just get nice new eaves and, and soffits and that'll be that. But it, there's a process that we're trying to, across the country, people are pushing to get swifts in people's minds when undergoing those sort of renovations. Uh, in order to to give swifts back that opportunity that we've given them for generation upon generation to share our urban areas together with them with this incredible bird in which is a very clean bird very evocative bird it has so many cultural connotations it's with poetry and art and just the sheer pleasure of sitting out in a summer evening and seeing these things screaming around you and knowing that in a few months they'll be back to Africa um, and it's an emblem of the conservation concern that is the long distance migrant insect eating bird that's linked to climate change populations of of insects and and all that probably comes into it there's been problems with with swifts migrating back in the spring and hitting hard weather which might well be becoming more frequent with climate change um, and of course we all know that insect bi biomass has just plummeted over the last few decades. So by thinking about swifts um, and trying to help them not only through uh, provisioning nest sites for them, but also keeping in mind climate change and, uh, and insect population health, that, that's really a, a, an opportunity for wider conservation because those issues affect ecosystems on such a grand scale. And I've just gone ahead of myself a bit there because that, yeah, so th this is this is um, basically what, what I mentioned earlier. Um, so nest sites, flying insects and weather patterns, that's our, our best thinking so far and why they've declined. And I can't really see any reason to doubt, doubt that, particularly the, the nest sites issue. Um, now, the good news is, as I say, we can we can help. So how do you do that? Um, protect the current nest sites is a big one. So if you know where they're nesting, 
do record it. Bird tracks, Swift Mapper, um, they're the best places to put it, put that information and keep an, uh, liaise with landowners to and local authorities to make sure um, that those nest sites aren't going to be threatened and do it in a way that, that's not going to frighten them off. Don't, don't say, oh, you know, you've got loads of birds nesting under your eaves and, and what you're going to do about it to say, approach them with a, a leaflet that, you know, is readily available in, on the internet or if you get in touch with me, I can provide you with some material and say, introduce them to the Swift first and say, look, you, you're so lucky to have these nesting on your building. How about um, keeping them in mind when, when the time comes to, to work on the building? And then expanding colonies is is the next stage from there. Um, so that's working out where they where they already are, and then offering them opportunities to expand that population, that local population. Um, and from that, you can then the bigger issue then, and the bigger opportunity is to provide more sites that more colony sites. Basically, once you once you've grown those colonies, then create more. Um, and increase insect populations. That's a trickier one, of course, and I, I certainly don't have the clear answer for that. Um, but in your own garden, just be very mindful of what you're, what you're putting out. Um, and of course, uh, and, and lobbying landowners and just being part of organizations like Greenpeace, RSPB, SOS, anyone who has an interest in, in keeping ecosystems healthy and just bearing that in mind with, with the product choices that you you make when you're out shopping and ordering things on the internet just thinking how is this going to impact ecosystems across the world and uh, particularly insect populations and it's a similar thing with climate change um, we can all just do our bit to help that factor in swift decline and, and everything and all the other things that are affected by climate change by making ethical choices as consumers and a big powerful one that will help other people do all of the above is spreading the word, try and be as enthusiastic as possible um, and share the word basically on Swifts and how great they are and how we can, how we can help them. Um, and what we do at the SOS is um, I, I took on this role, uh, I think a couple of years ago now, it doesn't seem like long because a lot of it has been uh, lockdown conditions. So I still feel very new to this, um, but I'm very excited to be able to be part of the SOS in championing this flagship species. Um, and at what I do as Swift champion and, and people who support me, such as the fantastic Audrey Wend, who's done it for, I think she did it for getting on for 20 years before I did, um, it is, yeah, pe people will come to us, say, we want to help Swifts. We want to organize together um, and do something and we'll then hopefully act as some sort of catalyst to bring people together and give them advice on on how to work together how to create opportunities for swifts and how to um, spread the word we can provide advice on nest boxes um, community engagement we can offer uh, events and, and speaking opportunities uh, such as this um, with local groups just to with people, it doesn't have to be bird groups at all. In fact, it's almost better if it, if, if we can um, reach more people and more groups that, that aren't bird focused, because um, this is an urban issue uh, that affects so many, uh, that a lot of people have the opportunity to, to help with. Um, so yeah, any general community groups that will, we often find that they're, they're really keen to help Swifts. Um, so yeah, we, we're just acting as a, a central co co communication and advice point for all things Swift, uh, Swift conservation within uh, Sussex. And starting a local Swift group is a, a fantastic way of doing it. Um, so there's, there's quite a few already in Sussex, such as a very successful one in Lewis and Brighton, and uh, there's Wynn Chelsea as well. Um, just to name a few, uh, Henfield Birdwatch has quite a, a, a strong swift arm uh, and all you need really is some like-minded folk. So find say at least three people locally who like swifts, which hopefully isn't too hard to do. Um, get yourselves together and, and have a think, uh, 
um, about forming a group. Um, it doesn't have to be a formally constituted thing. Um, we've just where I live in Worthing, we're it looks like we're just starting a group here, and at the moment it's just based on a Facebook group, which I think actually is a, is quite a good way of doing it, of communicating with each other uh, either privately or publicly on the group to organise um, approaches to to issues to do with Swift locally, um, and get it all moving from there. And then once you've got those people together. You then decide how do you bring more people in? How do you how do you spread the word? Do you use social media? So yeah, Twitter, Facebook, create a website. Um, oh, the Hastings group, which I can't believe I forgot to mention. That's it's got so much energy and, and enthusiasm with Ian Donovan, who's I really admire his his drive. He's just got boundless energy, and he's got a fantastic uh, website. That's that's a, a real template for other people to to look at. Really, if if you type in um, Hastings and Robert Swifts, so I'm sure it'll come up pretty quickly. Um, and you can put all sorts of resources, resources on there for people, um, such as how to build a box, where to get a box, um, just key facts about Swifts and, and the issues that they face as well. Um, yes, and then initial meeting, usually that would be down a pub at the moment, but hopefully not too much longer. It'll be on, on Zoom, I suppose. But um, yeah, work out who you've got. If you need, if you reckon you need some money to, to maybe buy boxes or uh, hire people to put Swift boxes up, if you want to do it that way, you don't have to hire people to put Swift boxes up, but may, maybe you, you want to um, for a slightly easier life sometimes. Um, then, yeah, work out how you're going to raise funds, maybe by creating a, a local event, introducing people to the Swift. You could maybe charge a small admission fee at first um, to, to get that boost initially. And then you can start doing doing your work really. So your action, the actual action plan, um, which yeah, is three stages, essentially corresponding to what I mentioned earlier. Um, surveying, which is the foundation of all conservation. Work out what you've got, what you're working with in your local area. Um, so you can allocate different areas to different people, say by street or by postcode or by grid reference and so on. And there's all sorts, it depends how many people you've got and how much time you have and, and how dedicated you're gonna be able to be to it. But the main thing is to have some sort of rough idea of how many Swifts are, are there locally in your town or village, it will usually be, um, and where they are, yeah, where they are, how many there are. and how likely they are to be breeding. Um, so if you've got swift screaming lower around rooftops, they're, they're likely to be breeding. Um, but then there's further evidence on top of that that you can use um, birds banging, it's called, against, um, boxes, uh, against boxes which are likely to be prospecting birds. That's, um, that's, that's further evidence of breeding. And of course, if you see birds entering with uh, an engorged crop showing that they've got a bolus of food or you hear young inside or you, you see young poking their heads out or fledging then that is all confirmed evidence and the real best place to put that ultimately um, as well as the RSPB Swift mapper is uh, the BTO's bird track system that's a general bird watching recording system but that information ultimately uh, gets fed back in to um, yeah, the British Trust for Ornithology and also local groups such as the SOS and several times over my um, short tenure so far, I've, been, I've really made good use of being able to look on our database at information that's been put on bird track in order to um, to know what's going on in certain areas and, and push for, for certain things to happen with local authorities. Um, and then once you know where these colonies are, grow them. So stick boxes up if you happen to live where they are um, on your own house or encourage people where they are to to do that you can you can engage with them through online or in person dropping um, maybe a leaflet round or knocking at their door when it's safe to do so um, and saying hey why do why don't you put a swift box up they're really clean birds they won't make a nuisance of themselves and yeah they're fantastic why not um, grow these colonies um, and you can put swift boxes in as well. Um, they're obviously a lot trickier to do than a, br than a brick is far trickier to do than a box um, in an existing building, but it is possible to fit them. 
Um, and in a building that's just going up, um, bricks are, are definitely the, the way to go. Um, so if you're aware of a development near you, in an, particularly if it's an area in an area or near an area where there are swifts already, um, then do try and push for a, a brick system to be going in there. And then the far more ambitious thing to, to create new colonies from that, it's much harder to get swifts to take up nest sites uh, away from colonies that already exist. But with effort and patience, um, it will be worth it in the end. And um, that's ultimately the way to, to rever reverse in the decline. Um, both for bricks and boxes and new colonies and old colonies, the real booster is having a swift calling system, so a sound system that's automated on some sort of timer uh, to, to bring the swifts in, because it, otherwise it'll take them potentially quite a long time to cotton on to, oh, there's a really nice little hollow there that I could get in. But, but if they hear swifts screaming coming from that box, they'll, they'll draw them in and, uh, yeah, really point out that there's a fantastic nest site there. Now, for surveying, the best time is, is June and July, which is um, when the, the breeding population is gonna, gonna be there. From year to year, try and do it at the same time each year so that you can have that real meaningful comparison. You'll see if what you're doing is, is affecting the population in a positive way. Um, and that'll be really rewarding to see if you can see that. Um, and yeah, so it's always good to, Obviously, it's one of these birds where they're in an urban area, so you've got to be sensitive about walking around with binoculars. So it might be good to talk to people if you if you see them out in the front of their garden, or um, if you see them twitching their curtains or whatever. Just assure them that you, you're doing good ornithological field work, um, and and uh, yeah, let them know what you're doing. And oh, we've got survey forms that we've adapted um, specifically for collecting evidence on, on breeding in the EU and it, that really condenses it in a, in a meaningful way and it's hopefully quite user-friendly. So if you'd be interested in that, then get in touch and I'll remember to mention the email address at the end. Um, if I don't, hopefully Mark will remind me. Um, okay, so. Yeah, boxes are uh, readily available on the internet. If, um, Swift Conservation, their website is the best place to start looking. Um, and they've got various options on there as to as to what to buy. Um, and there's a huge range of, of prices and materials and options. And it tends to be the cheaper ones are, are less durable, but they, they'll still last a good good while. Um, and if you pay a bit more, then you'll have something that, that you know is gonna last for a, a real, real long time. Um, and it, it also depends on how you want it to fit in with your house. It, it, a lot of it is the aesthetics. You don't want this thing to look ugly on the side of your house, and it's definitely a way of making it look nice. So um, there's a, a good lot to browse through there. But at the SOS, we, have, we do have a small supply of boxes um, if you'd rather go down that route, but we, we don't have many. So um, do start by looking at the Swift Conservation website um, first. But yeah, if you need any tips or, or advice, do get in touch with us. Um, oh, and if you're into DIY and you're, you're handy, which I'm definitely not, I'm really not a carpenter of any kind. I can never imagine myself doing this, but yeah, if you're so inclined, I can imagine for some people, it'd be um, great fun to, to, you know, make your own box. Um, I just know I'd make a mess of it if I tried, but yeah, that's, that's definitely an option. If you've got some, some wood lying around, then, um, there's guides online to, to making a box. Now, someone with a cherry picker would be very useful because um, the real logistical problem with putting Swift boxes up for, for people like you and I is, is probably going to be, right, great, I've got this box here, but how on earth do I get it up? Um, and of course, only do so if you're confident of, of doing it safely. Um, and if you have somebody with a cherry picker, that would be Perfect. But as you build that network of local enthusiasts, this sort of thing will probably just fall into place. Now, um, boxes, there's a few, there's three or four key things about placing them. It should be at least four and a half meters off the ground. That's mainly because when Swifts fledge, they need that drop to then get airborne and get off. Otherwise, there might be these situations where 
um, you're picking up a, an exhausted bird on the ground. Um, and they need to be out of direct sunlight. So if they're uh, towards the south of the building, the south side of the building, make sure that they've got a good overhang to keep them out from that midday sun, but ideally place them somewhere between north and, and east on, on the face of the building. And make sure there's no wires, trees, other obstacles that, that are going to get in the way there because swifts aren't very, as great flies as they are, one of the few things that they, they can't really do very well is manoeuvre quickly in in short, um, in tight areas. So yeah, this is just a quick graphic showing um, what you need really. So south side with sun and an obstacle, no, but yeah, if you're at least four and a half metres tall on the building um, and away from the south side or at least in the shade and with a clear flight path in, then you're on. Um, yeah, Swift uh, playing Swift recordings will really help. So that that's easily. Uh, it, it sounds complicated at the face of it, but you just need a timer, some sort of power system, and the uh, speaker amplifier. And there's a few kits online um, to 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 try that are, people are starting to make ready-made ones. Um, yeah, so they're not messy. All they, they, the only thing they use for nesting material is stuff they, they can pick out in the air. That's another thing that they do while they're airborne. They'll pick out flying, uh, floating bits of a uh, feather in the air, and that's pretty much what they add to it. And there's no um, feces being propelled out and, and strewn all, all over the wall. It's all it's all uh, in there and then decays over the course of, of the time that the swifts aren't aren't in the box. Um, yeah, and the, the final stage really is creating new colonies, um, as I say, which is, is tricky. But once you've grown your existing colonies, that, that, that's then a chance that you might be able to take. Planning authorities, yeah. Um, this is uh, for people who are a bit more adventurous and, and people who want to get stuck in with, with local issues. Um, we've had some success over the last year or two in, in a few towns of getting planning conditions attached to um, uh, planning conditions in local areas where uh, in unsuitable buildings, you need to put a swift box up if, if certain criteria, uh, sorry, swift bricks, swift bricks fitted if your um, application involves a, a building that, that is fitting those criteria in that it's near where swifts already nest and it's suitable. Yeah, and these are the, hopefully you can see in the, yeah, my, my screen was just blocking that, but that shows a, a swift brick fitting seamlessly in with a building. Um, they're great for new builds. If you're planning one yourself or, or you can influence local planning, then, you know, what is to lose by putting swift bricks in? Even if there aren't swifts in the area at that moment, then who knows, there might be in the future. And then they'll have somewhere to nest um, from, from the, Go and and build. Uh, developers these days are always looking for easy wins with biodiversity. Um, they tend to need to to show that they're boosting biodiversity with their development. So a swift box and or, or swift brick is an an easy win uh, for developers. And to sum up, I'm I've sort of lost track of how much time I've used up. I feel like I'm probably getting towards the end, or who knows, maybe even run over. But um. Yeah, to sum up, it's all about boxes. So expand, expand colonies, create new colonies, um, and and give them the chance to um, be helped. So let's help our Swifts. And uh, just here's some people who helped with, with the information graphics that you've seen. Um, and that is all. So hopefully I've roughly gone to the time. There Thank you, you very much, David. That was that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a, it's a really terrific example of, uh, of people action. You know, it's something where all of us can get engaged uh, and make a difference. So, so thanks a lot. I think the best tribute I can pay to your talk is that there is an extraordinarily large number of questions and there's no way we're going to be able to get through all of them. So I'm going to pass straight over to Richard Cowser, who's the SOS's conservation officer, um, and he's got the unenviable job of trying to pick out some of the questions for you to answer. All the rest we'll answer later, and the answers will appear on the SOS website. So over to you, uh, Richard and David. Thank you very much, Mark.
Yes, lots of questions in. Uh, several questions concerning uh, sparrows occupying uh, swift nest boxes before the swifts arrive. And perhaps if I sum it up in one question, um, should we take, should we try and block the swift box nest holes off until the swifts arrive? And is there evidence that swifts can oust sparrows if they've taken up residency in their nests? Well, house sparrows, of course, are another bird that has been a conservation concern over time. So we really want to help them as well. But there's nothing inherently wrong with, there's a few approaches to this. You, you could, if, if, you, if you're confident sparrows aren't nesting at that moment, you could theoretically block the box off before they get a chance and then open it up again at the end of April. And then you'll have a peace of mind at least that swifts will come in and, and not have any, any competition. But I tend to prefer to say to, to leave them to their own devices. Often you'll find that between house sparrow broods, that'll be when swifts are coming in. And there is evidence, I believe, that, that swifts will, if they really want to nest somewhere, they'll they'll chuck a sparrow out. I think there's a, a record of one sitting on a sparrow to death, um, if I recall correctly. So I, I think that's the answer. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. I assume it's food, but why do swifts travel so far just to spend three months of the year breeding here in Great Britain? Well, like most other summer migrants, they, um, they're coming here because temperate climates with our, our longer days in the summer, much longer than, than in, in the tropics and, and near the equator, they offer long hours to feed and there's a real um, deluge of insect food here in, in temperate climes in the summer. And of course, uh, availability of nest sites as well is, is part of it because we still obviously have something to offer there, um, uh, which we're trying to build on. But yeah, they come here because they know there's somewhere to nest. And primarily, I suppose, the driver is um, that in that availability of food to rear their young. Okay. Question about their nest boxes. I have heard that you need more than one swift box as they like to nest with, it, with, swifts, with other swifts. Is that correct? And if so, how many uh, boxes do you need? Um, well, if you, you usually be starting by having swifts in the area anyway. So even if you only have space to put one box up, that's a, that's a good idea because um, that will still act as part of the wider colony. Um, but of course, yeah, if you can put more up, that would be ideal. And and uh, having nests nearer together, that they'll probably feel, feel better that way. Um, so if you can put, say, I don't know, but three or four up if you can. Um, that that would be really good on a, on a normal house. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd say. Okay. Um, Swifts are declining in the UK. Are they declining also in Europe? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, I, I I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure. I'm I'm quite certain at least that they're not doing very very well out there. Um, yeah, so I don't really know the answer to that, but I'm quite sure they're at best stable in Europe and probably mostly declining. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that information, if you if you do a quick Google, I'm curious about that now. So um, <laughs> I'm sure that hopefully in some places they're doing better than here, but I, I guess they're not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what do we know, David, about the habitat in their African locations? Is it reasonable to suggest that uh, their African habitats are also coming under um, pressure, and that may be one another reason why they're declining? Um, well, on their migration route, they're probably uh, that's probably where the habitats changing the most on the edges of the Sahara. Um, although I know people are, are trying to to create that green um, corridor of trees to to prevent the desertification there, but yeah, that's a barrier to a lot of um, migrant birds. I think in their wintering range, there's less of a problem in terms of dramatic habitat change. Um, somebody might correct me on that some, at some point, but I think it's this wider global issue of of insect populations and, and general ecosystem health that no doubt is, is also a problem in, in Africa to some extent, at least. Uh, somebody asks, if I get a swift nest box, Am I supposed to clean it out after they've nested? Uh, no, I think it's best to, to leave it there. The, the natural, uh, yeah, it, it, 
stuff will decay. There'll be um, invertebrates in there and, and parasites that will break down um, the, the material. So yeah, it is sort of self operating. You, you don't need to do any dirty work with that. And anyway, they're quite high up, so they're not that easy to get to, to clean out in the way that a tit nest box would be, I guess. Exactly, yeah. Um, okay. Um, somebody's asking, um, is there any data on life expectancy and survival rates for, uh, for the young? And we know that hobby is a predator of swifts, are there other predators that they need to be aware of? Um, they don't have a, as many major natural predators as, as a lot of small birds do. Um, yeah, hobby is is, a, is one. I, re I remember one year at All Marshes seeing a pair of hobbies almost work together to, to catch a swift. Um, but yeah, peregrines are capable of doing it. Um, and occasionally something like a sparrow hawk will probably get lucky. Uh, with a swift but yeah it has to be something really quite nimble like a falcon so in africa i'm sure other species perhaps like lanners um will have a go um off the top of my head i don't really know about um young survival rates and longevity um as as a uh specifically but i might have uh, oh the, the oldest known swift was 21 years so i don't know about whether that was ringed as a as a, as young or not, it probably was. Um, but yeah, that's the only information I have to hand about longevity. So that's that's a good good um, age, isn't it? Mm. Okay. Um, somebody's asking: Are there swifts in the north of Scotland? Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure there are. Certainly, in yeah, well, in the Highlands, there's this, there's this natural population nest in trees. Um, and I think in the north of Scotland, you're only really going to be limited by availability of nest sites. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure where the most northern breeding swifts are. But I think sure I they, think uh, they're actually up to I think they're actually right up to almost John O'Groats. Um, yeah. They're up the east coast of Scotland, but I don't think they're particularly found on the Western Isles or along the western coast of Scotland. Yeah, I imagine there's not many opportunities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, okay. Um, question, do Swifts reuse their nests? Yeah, they'll tend to come back to the same nest each year and that's um, a lot of, uh, so they don't, as far as I understand, they don't um, have a, a lifelong bond as such, but they'll, they'll come back, the two birds will come back to the same nest and therefore they'll effectively have that lifelong bond in that they, they return to the same place and end up breeding together again, as far as I recall. Okay. Somebody else um, has uh, put a question. We've set up eight boxes on the side of a barn with a calling system. Should we play the calling system? When should we play the calling system? Morning, evening, for how long? Ideally, as much as possible. If, in an ideal world, uh, from late April all the way through August, twenty, you know, twelve hours a day, every every hour of, of daylight. But um, obviously that might give you or your neighbours a headache so if you need to focus that sound and that that energy then um yeah mornings evenings um and from say mid-june uh through to, to early august that would be if you have to focus it that would be the time to do so the time of day and the time of year right. okay and the last question here and the one or two similar ones um at Shalford in surrey there is a new swift tower with swift calls being played. How long before the swifts will nest there and do swift towers work? Um, I think there's, I'm sure they have, there has been some success with swift towers. I gather it's a bit more hit and miss than with uh, traditional uh, methods, but yeah, it, there's no harm in putting them up. They're definitely worth doing. Um, and in terms of how long it takes, uh, that, that entirely depends on how near there's a colony. And even then, it might take a couple of years or so if a swift's nearby. Um, so it's, it's not something that's an instant win. But if you put something, put a box up or a tower or bricks, um, and you're patient, then at some point you'll probably, you know, find it's worthwhile in, in, over the course of a few years at most. Thank you very much, David. I think we're out of time now, so I'm going to hand back to Mark. Thanks very okay. much indeed. And um, 
yeah, there, there's been an absolute record number of questions. We're up to 77 now. So David's going to be busy answering some <laughs> questions uh, after this, and we'll we'll post them, as I said, on the on the SOS website. So Richard, thank you for handing the the Q and A, and David, thank you very much again for sharing your your deep knowledge of Swiss and for inspiring all of us uh, to take practical action. It, it's been a, a terrific opportunity, I think. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. Um, the you. next talk by the uh, SOS in this series is this time next week, and it's Mike Russell, the chairman of the SOS uh, Council, talking about Henfield, the Sussex village and its birds. I strongly recommend that. Uh, if you're not a member of the SOS, do consider joining us. So if you'd like to make a donation, uh, it will all go to conservation of birds, 100% birds and their habitats. So thank you all very much indeed and enjoy the rest of your evening. Cheerio.